Want to have your own business but don't want to start from scratch? Franchising might be the answer you're looking for. Welcome to the Level Up with Nick Lopez show. The show that brings you thought leaders in business, franchising, and high-performance personal development. Whether you're a buyer, seller, franchisee, franchisor, or a consultant, find everything you need to know about franchising right here. Own a business without the pain and financial losses that come with creating it. Find the time, freedom, and financial independence you can have through entrepreneurship. Learn how franchising can help you get there. Listen up and get ready for another episode of The Level Up with Nick Lopez Show. Welcome to The Level Up Show with Nick Lopez, where we have the absolute pleasure of learning from thought leaders in business, franchising, and high-performance personal development I am very excited for today's guest, as he goes without exception, he is the founder and CEO of Home Run Franchises, Thomas Scott. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Nick. It's good to join you. I'm excited about this. I'm excited to share all of your collective wisdom, all of your years of experience. My gosh, I really think that our audience and the world will benefit from all of what you've learned uh, building franchise systems, specifically in the home services world. Uh, Thomas, I, yeah, how did you start Home Run Franchises? It's such an amazing group of franchise brands, uh, but I want to hear it right from you. Why and how did you start it? Well, you know, I'm, I've been in franchising for a little over 25 years at this point, and um, for a lot of people my age, I didn't set out to be a franchisor or a franchisee for that matter, and just kind of fell into the industry. Mm -hmm. I started out as a franchisee for a company called Show Homes Home Staging in the very early 2000s, 2001, 2002, and it was the, the country's largest home staging franchise, and I had three units, and I'd come out of a career mm -hmm. as a newspaper journalist and photographer, total, totally different. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how my marketing and I came to it from storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. I really liked that business. It was a lot of fun. And I realized that I, I really enjoyed being a business owner. And that was like liberating for me. And it changed the lives of the people around me. I was able to employ people and grow and help people. And the franchisor at the time mm -hmm. um, had a heart attack. This was 2002. And he um, he said, well, you know, you're my top franchisee. <laughs> Would you be willing to buy this or take it over from me? I said, I don't, I don't know. I have $37 in my business account. I don't think that's the way that works. <laughs> he goes, no, you just get some partners and you'd be surprised. I would sell it to you. I wouldn't sell it to anybody else because you know the business and you have an aptitude. Mm -hmm. for it. So sure enough, I got some partners. We bought it. We grew it to 100 units. That company's still around today and thriving, doing well. And I ran it for seven years. As a, it, it did development. I did operations. I did marketing. I did manage the team, did all the training, did every job in a franchise system. And so I, mm -hmm. I got seat and it was the hardest gig I've ever had I went from being the top performing franchisee to the bad guy like overnight um because I thought well everybody will like me and I'm a franchisee this will be easy I had to learn the really hard lessons of franchising the, you know the hard way like really kind of brutal like right up front and so that led me into a career of franchising um, I've run a supplier business that does franchise development marketing called brand journalist and have franchised eight other brands along the way. So this, I'm kind of a serial enthusiast about franchising, but I've got four brands under the home run brand um, kind of umbrella. Uh, two of them are growing at a really good clip this year, Up Closets and Dryer Vent Superheroes. But we do the Lighting Squad and uh, Lifestyle Window Films, but super fun. I, I thought that um, as you, that there is a really need for service. Like I believe that the service space is really hot right now and there aren't enough viable, um, substantial, well-run franchise systems to satisfy the demand. They're, they're franchising. We, I think we recruit between eighteen and 20,000 new people a year in our industry out of the, you know, five or 6,000 brands there are in the U.S. This, today. Um, and yet there are 25 million people looking to start a business at any point. So just the sheer numbers of who wants to be a business owner and what we have, I think service is the logical entry point for most people. <laughs> You know, most people don't have a half million dollars to buy a restaurant or, or 
some huge business, but they can scrape up 80 or 100 or 150 or 50 in the case of mine and buy something affordable. And I think services um, where the, the the industry needs to start people, because like you, I'm really committed to coaching people and teaching them how to grow a prosperous business. I know you're super data oriented and um, have a great culture in your brands, but it was really out of a, a goal of um, not so much building brands to sell, building brands to incubate and grow multi-unit owners out of, because there's not enough of that in our industry. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely agree with that. Absolutely. You know, Thomas, uh, you had mentioned something early on and, you know, I could definitely dive into uh, you know, talking about growth and, and and so many different pieces, but I, I want to take it to some lessons learned there. You know, you'd mentioned a nugget, you know, hey, I went from the good guy to the bad guy and learned some hard industry lessons. What what did you mean by that? Yeah, you know, when you're the when you're a top performer in a system and you're like you have a seat at the table, you're pioneering the decisions the company's growing, you're setting records you're growing at a rapid pace. And, you know, when, whenever in a system you have a top performer come along, they can sometimes change the way people perceive the possibilities of the business. And that was happening in my space um, when I was a multi-unit franchisee. I had three units. And I had very close, deep relationships with the other or franchisees. We did a franchise advisory council. I was just involved in the, you know, involved knee-deep in the business because I'm all in kind of guy. And when I became the franchisor, um, um, and it came time to collect royalties or kind of get people structured and kind of help improve the business. What I thought was improving the business wasn't, <laughs> um, I had this top down idea of how you run a franchise system, never having run one. And I realized really quickly that um, if people wanted um, a boss, they would have gotten a job, <laughs> you know, period. Like that's a franchising is a people business. I would say franchising is a two metric business. Um, it really is about having happy franchisees first. So for me, that's the primary thing. You, you have to enjoy the business you're in. Like if you if you have enough money to buy a franchise, chances are you can do just about anything in our society. So you, it needs to be fun and enjoyable. And then it needs to be financially rewarding equally part. So you have to be happy, profitable franchisees. And if you can't do that, um, things get really, you know, business is hard. Any business is hard. <laughs> Franchises, I think, are generally easier to operate and scale and grow and they're worth more and they perform at a higher level, but it doesn't mean they're easy. <laughs> you know, you still have to, um, you still have to, um, you know, work at it a little bit. Have you found that to be the case in yours? Oh, absolutely. You know, the business isn't going to run itself and it's important to set that expectation and, and to your point, right? It's about lifestyle fit and and expectations and and uh, in our business, at least, especially in, in being a service based company, and and you're not having a brick and mortar, right? We're going out into the field and and we're growing the brand. It's it's uh, ground level, you know, boots on the ground and growing the portfolio really from scratch and uh, doing that in the community. That takes work. That takes effort. And as an owner, if you're an owner operator, you're doing that. If you're building a team, you know, just because you have a team in place doesn't mean that they know what to do, uh, they know when to do it, and they know what matters, right? So, you know, that all takes effort and intentionality. But what we're talking around is uh, it takes work. Yeah, you know, I learned, and the key lessons I learned in going from being a multi unit owner who was very successful as a franchisee to a franchisor, I think that makes me a better franchisor because like I think about things when I say I've intentionally created a franchisee centric culture, much like you have, um, like I put the franchisee first, like there's a big range of FTC open comments right now. If you kind of look at all the changes to the, the franchise rule that are underway as we speak, um, a lot of it is around um, brands that don't understand what being franchisee centric is. Franchisees are my customers. <laughs> they're my partners. They're the people that I um, they pay royalty. So I stay in business. You know, like I believe that they use the business model I develop to better themselves and make a an positive impact in their community. And I really believe franchising is the one way that somebody can participate in the economy at their full market value. In a lot of ways, it's a more diverse income segment, um, business segment. It's the most diverse segment I think we have in American business. And it also, um, it's a democratization of capitalism. <laughs> you know, anybody can participate in franchising. Like anybody who raises their hand 
and says, I've got the drive. I want to be a Gary V or I want to be a Mark Cuban. I, I, I want to do that. Like the steps are there one step at a time. You can take that journey. Anybody from any background, any ethnicity, any skin color. We're like the army. We just, we don't care <laughs> if you have the drive and the passion and the enthusiasm and the resources and you're willing to put the work in like you're talking about. Why, why wouldn't we give somebody that opportunity? It's a, it's a, a beautiful thing to see that happen. But the, the lessons that I've learned are that um, franchising is a people business. <laughs> it's just full of deeply complex relationships. And we're not in the, you know, I'm not in the closet business or the dryer vent cleaning business, or you're not in the painting business. We're both in the recruiting, training, supporting, coaching, developing people business. Like that's what we do. It's to help people run a better version of a business than they'd ever be able to run left to their own devices. So when you say the FTC rule, for those that aren't familiar, can you shed a little light there? Yeah, the FTC, um, and not very often, this is the second time in my whole career that this has come up, um, is asking for public feedback on the nature of franchise relationships, the franchise documentation, the disclosure process, and franchise agreements. And they're asking um, people for comments. And most of the comments that have come in have been negative, only been two or 300 comments. Most of them are from disgruntled people who've had bad experiences in big, mostly food chains. Um, you know, the things like the Unleashed Brands, Premier Martial Arts has taken, I think half of the comments are from that, that debacle. But what they're asking is, should you be able to negotiate your franchise agreement? And should the franchisor be able to change the operations of the business after you sign? And should you have to follow them? <laughs> you know, like, are you able to buy um, raw materials like a food in the case of a restaurant at a more affordable price point if you can get it locally then do you have to buy it from the franchise or um, are you able to like exit the agreement and have had a non-competes work all those kinds of things um, which I think are um, bring to the they're kind of leading questions they bring up people who've had bad experiences but what they don't talk about is it's been open for 90 days. There have been 200 comments. There's a million franchise locations in the United States, like 1 million. Um, the overwhelming majority of people like have prosperous, fun businesses. Like I, I don't have disgruntled people in my systems. I don't think you do either. Um, you know, we have people who really get up every day and go, wow, this business really rocks. It's kind of fun. Like I think I'm going to buy more units. <laughs> you know, we have people reinvesting in the model and going. But I, I do think that... Um, that's a, it's a good point to make about relationships that because franchising is such a relationship driven business that you have to start out everything you do in your business has to be focused on building a positive relationship, you know, building a relationship that's built on trust and empathy and um, respect and giving franchisees a seat at the table so that the decisions that don't happen to them, <laughs> like it's what I was doing when I was a franchisor in the beginning, as I was saying, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to change our ad program and we're going to do digital marketing. So back in 2002, we're going to have websites and people didn't want to spend money on websites. They didn't even know what a website was or it didn't have broadband internet. You know, it was back in the dark ages. Or as my kids say, it was black when everything was black and white. That's They asked me, what was it like to grow up when everything was black and white? <laughs> back in the early two, their view of the world. But the, um, but you know, it's, you have to say, look, like how can we make this business better you know, you have to influence people in positive ways. Like what, you know, how would you take your painting business and add a whole nother um, sales kind of silo? Or how would you um, be able to increase your tickets and have happier customers and get into a more specialized version of your industry, whatever it is? You know, what if you did A, B, and C? Does that, would that work for you? Would you be willing to try that out with us and be our guinea pig and experiment on it? And I find when franchisees, when you involve them in the business development itself and give them a seat at the decisions, they'll often make the same decisions you would as a franchisor. But if you force it on them, people's automatic response is not no, but hell no. <laughs> I don't want any part of that. Like, leave me alone. Why, why are you bothering me? You know, it's 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 a really like um, um, counterintuitive business for a franchisor to learn. Have you had that experience in yours? Like, what's what's it been like for you? Oh, a thousand percent. And it's to to the point you're making, right? Uh, you know, you have every good intent to improve the system, but without infrastructure for collaboration, uh, you know, it creates a bottleneck. And clearly, franchise owners are in business for themselves, and they want to be in business with other business owners. That's the whole benefit of, excuse me, of franchising. Yeah. But 
but yeah, if you don't have that open ear and it's top down, then it really does create uh, an, an issue within the franchise system. And uh, early on, we went through that as well. And uh, it was a growing pain for myself. And, and uh, I had all the intent. I designed the model to be collaborative. And I thought I was stewarding, stewarding the brand with good intent in rolling out new initiatives. But really, I was doing it independent from the system. And uh, good thing, I'm, good thing I, I appreciate feedback and can be coachable. Uh, because I quickly learned that that wasn't going to be a successful way to to run the franchise as a franchisor. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's interesting that it's not a hard lesson to teach some way, but franchisors are really I mean, we surround ourselves with corporate staff, and a lot it's one of the real shortcomings of our business model is that most of the people, a large percentage of the people I see that work in emerging brands as corporate support people. They start out as like an employee of a franchise or a founder's business. Like they work in the core business and then they get moved up to corporate support person because they know the model. That doesn't make them a good franchisor or franchise. They don't really have the intellectual capital to understand that, you know, this person is um, counting on you to help them grow the business and they leverage their house and their car and their life savings to take this opportunity. And um, they don't want you to tell them what to do. <laughs> they want you to help them materialize the promise that the brand made to them in the beginning and so that's it's like a whole different um, level of intellectual kind of thinking that goes into how do you support someone I tell my people like look start every conversation with like what do you want to take away from this call and how can we help you <laughs> let's get that out of the way first like what are the things that are really bothering you in your business or the things that you need the most help with and let's make sure we take care of those before we start talking about our agenda and what we want. And then we got some ideas on how to get you to the next level. We want to invite you to uh, experiment on some things with this. Or would you like to be part of a pilot group for a new type of ad that we're going to do? And we'll maybe subsidize part of it because it's not proven. But I'm, I think as a marketing person, this holds merit. And here's why I think it'd be good for you. Here's what's in it for you. What do you think? And I find that it, when you have dialogue like that in small groups or individually, it opens up a whole nother level of performance. Like, I, do you find that to be the case in your business? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's that's really coming from a one-on-one -on -one perspective, right? Coaching one-on-one -on -one and, and uh, yeah, putting it in front of the franchise owner that, hey, what, what, what would you like to accomplish? What a question. But uh, make it theirs by involving them in that dialogue. And that's what happened. And, um, you know, we do, we have Facebook support groups or we do lots of back and forth on Facebook. We use our Facebook kind of a closed support group is a really important tool for training and ongoing support. We do Zoom calls every other week. We have lots of like small group performance groups. Um, I try to get them to ask if somebody has a win, um, we try to celebrate wins and then say, hey, is there something there that we should all be doing? And I'll get that person to talk about what they did and say, and then come back with like, here's some ways we could systemize that. You know, we could use this vendor for this. And here's the, like a sample ad you could try and a suggested budget if you want to experiment on your local stuff, you know, wh whatever it is. And but constantly innovating. I think the role of a founder and a CEO is less to be driving the operations day to day and more to be evolving the business model and improving the relationship with franchisees. Like that's all I do. <laughs> when I'm not recruiting franchisees is, is try to make people like feel like heard and loved and cared about. And, you know, like, you know, we, we are really proud of you as an owner, you're killing it. And, you know, whatever your goal is, that brings up another, a couple of other points. Um, Cause you're a huge culture fan. I really um, love the culture you've built in your, your brands. I, I find there really are two types of cultures in franchise systems. And one's really positive one's less so, there's either a compliance culture of franchises where everything's really strict and orderly and you have to stay within a really narrow box and the people are always telling you what you can't do or what you're doing wrong. Um, restaurant brands are famous for this type of cultures. Um, and then there's performance cultures. I think when we get into, um, you know, really um, it's like service brands, like we're operating, the performance culture is like, where do you want to be in three years? Let's come up with systems to help you get there. <laughs> You know, it's more of a like, let's go out and conquer the universe kind of culture and less of a like, you're not doing it right. 
let's focus on what you're doing right. You are doing right. And let's build on that. And every person is really different. You know, even though it's a franchise system, like you would run a painting business different than I would run a painting business or my wife would run a painting business or the next guy down the road. Have you had any experience with those two types of cultures or do you buy into that idea? Yeah. And it's, it's a, it, it, it's an interesting juxtaposition there, right? Uh, Cause performance is generally the result of compliance and and that is the beautiful core uh component of a successful franchise is executing on the model and and that's what's been proven and worked out and and, and is the winning formula that a franchisee you know gets into business within a franchise setting you know they they are choosing to not create and and uh, and bootstrap getting into the marketplace and failing to success in innovating a winning formula within the market, one that consumers say, yep, sign me up, that gives me value. And you know, there's systems built around delivering that value. Uh, you know, that is a consistent juxtaposition there where you know you want performance and you want uh, you know, compliance as a franchisor, because compliance leads to, you know, maintaining the integrity of the brand. You know, the, the brand is, is only as good as it is consistent. Granted, you want the flexibility and the collaboration to, to give feedback, to improve the business model, because not everything is perfect and the market's always changing. And and because of that, there needs to be processes and infrastructure, that culture that welcomes innovation from the ground level. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it creates an interesting juxtaposition in that, um, look, no franchise owner is going to enjoy a culture of compliance, right? Yeah. And, and everybody loves to win and be a high performer and get results. And, and so I think there has to be, you know, at the core of that trust, trust that, look, the compliance is going to be for my benefit. And I trust that I have a voice and I, and I trust that if I have uh, feedback, it will be innovated into the model, which is essentially a by which leads to compliance, right? And, and so I think compliance is, it, it, you know, it's it's a bad word for somebody coming from corporate America, firing their boss, jumping into a franchise. You know, there's just a natural pent up, you know, frustration toward corporate. And, you know, we've done everything we can to disassociate ourselves with that corporate um, perspective, right? So we, we call ourselves the home office. For us, corporate, if you refer to us as corporate, it's a bad, it's a naughty word. It's much like compliance. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we try not to use the word compliance. We try not to use the word corporate. Uh, but again, fundamentally compliance or following the model, you know, you can, you can, uh, you know, make it less, like, uh, you can trigger less franchise owners by saying following the model as opposed to yeah. uh, being in compliance. Uh, so I think that's you know a fine line to walk there, but Good point. I like the triggering yeah. franchise owners. You know, it's the two aren't independent of each other. Like if you're compliant, doesn't mean you don't have performance, and if you're a high performance culture, doesn't mean you lack compliance. I, I think I go about in my systems. Um, the lesson that I've learned over the time I've been in is that you have to start out building that trust with a roadmap. If you're dealing with, especially in an emerging or incubated systems, I start our systems from scratch. So we're dealing with a lot of brand new people. The kind of person that um, joins um, a new system with like less than 10 or 15 system, you know, units is a very different type of operator that might join somebody with 80 or 100 units. Like they're just, they're just different parts of the market segment. And I find that I've got to sit people down because um, I go after a lot of young entrepreneurs. I'm very big on Gen Z buyers. I like um, diversity kind of recruitment. I like giving people opportunities that um, are not necessarily, wouldn't normally get, can't afford 150K. Like I, I have business models and ways to get people in business at a much lower rate. But I sit down and say, where do you want to be? Like if you were a franchise, like Nick, where do you want to be in three years? Like wh why are we, 
it's great you're doing this, but why are we doing it? <laughs> like, what do you mm. want to, because I would tell you that, um, you know, in this remote work era we're in, there's a profound lack of professional development happening with young, younger people. Mm. They're not around in an office surrounded by older, more experienced people all day. They don't have the advantage of coffee cooler talks and solving problems and learning how to deal with issues. They just don't have them. They're in mom's basement working on a laptop on a Slack channel. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's while that's great for freedom it definitely has a negative professional development component to it you're just missing out on some stuff and so that's one of the things i think franchising can deliver on is a more intentional professional development of the franchise owner because our goals are aligned if i don't develop that person into an executive and a high acumen business owner they're not going to grow into three four or five units like I, mm -hmm. that's into this and so i start with that I said, good, that's the goal. <laughs> I want you to understand that your time is worth $400 an hour as an owner. Like that's what you're worth if you're willing to take the jump off the cliff and start a business. That's that's what you bought. <laughs> it's this ability to produce an engine that will deliver that for you and your family. If you buy into that, the best way to get there is obviously through compliance. <laughs> I don't call it compliance. I said, like, here's the fastest way to fall the system. Now, if you have a better way to get at the system, um, I'm all ears because if there's a improvement we can make we should all stop and pay attention to that you know I have mm -hmm. a I have a kid that's a hockey player he just graduated high school last week and was going off to study franchising at Palm Beach Atlantic I'm really mm -hmm. excited but he um he was a really aggressive hockey player and he had a real hard time with his emotions he's an ADHD kid and he um he would just lose his, his he loses cool on the ice and hockey is an emotional aggressive game to start with like it's probably the <laughs> play but he was very good at it and he his coach sat him down um one time after he had a frustrating he was mad at himself because he missed a shot and they lost the game and he got really mad on the bench and threw a stick or broke a stick or something stupid and the coach said look you know if you're going to go out on the ice and you're going to score five goals you can come back to the bench and act like a donkey all you want i'll be happy to have you but if you're going to go out and screw up and be mad at yourself and berate your teammates and act like a donkey i don't really need that on the team like that's a bad thing you have to kind of control and that's that's kind of what it's like to coach um new franchisors is you know getting them to understand that we're all in this together and the goal is to get the goal that you identify and I, when i find when i get franchisors to voice to understand that the 400 dollars an hour mark is theirs and that there's actually a path that we can lay out then the why i have to follow all these systems makes more sense mm -hmm. i think franchise systems really run into trouble and I've been a multi-unit owner myself in five or six different systems in my career. Um, I had coffee shop franchises and I love coffee. I grew up in New Orleans. I'm a big coffee person. Running boutique specialty coffee shops was on my bucket list. And, you know, we did that for a bunch. I think happened in mine is the culture of the franchise system. The franchise brand was amazing. The products were great. The operational support culture was, was not that great in that system. And that was really frustrating for my wife and I. And we would develop stuff because we were pioneers and got involved early on. And we had a menu that we worked on that was performing at a really high level. And mm -hmm. the operations guy come in and say, we want to re-engineer the menu. And you have to use the new menu. The new menu had a 20% lower ticket. It, it, it cost everybody lost money on it. And mm -hmm. instead of saying, well, maybe we got it wrong <laughs> um, or we did testing it out and saying, we tested it out and here's the data. It looks like it's better than the one you have forcing something on in the name of compliance that is, uh, causes you to underperform as a franchisee, that kills a relationship when that happens. And that's really what I mean by compliance cultures. You know, people not thinking about what's in it for the franchisee as in the forefront and thinking about their own ideas first and then whatever happens, happens. Because they bought a, a franchise because they wanted to follow a system. I don't know a single owner that would tell you that that's why they bought a franchise. Right, they, they bought it to be in business for themselves and to create all of the benefits that come with entrepreneurship, the American dream of owning a company, and and uh, that that creates this interesting dynamic that isn't always so logical. Yeah, no, no it's emotional. <laughs> it's an emotional thing. Like it's that part of it is really interesting. Is you know why why do you buy? what I find with younger buyers, and I think we should probably spend some time talking about Gen Z buyers and just younger buyers and how their whole value proposition of why a franchise is smart to buy is changing. Um, I find that they're um, 
interested in the professional development part of a franchise. Like they're interested mm -hmm. in what the franchise can deliver to them um, more than the actual just financial performance. And most importantly, mm -hmm. I hear people talk about, well, you know, like running a business because they're, they're surrounded by influencers on, you go on Instagram or TikTok or any of the real stuff. And it's, it's one more smart business person after another doing Gary V style marketing, sharing a lot of really valuable content. Like I do it myself. I think it's really helpful. Um, but what they hear is that running a business is hard and lonely <laughs> and mm -hmm. running a franchise is the opposite of that. Like you, it's a social network version of a business. You're in a community of people doing exactly the same thing. And there's something to be said for a team sport version of business where you and your teammates go out and conquer the universe as a team and do high fives and have parties and <laughs> goof off and get swag. And, you know, have, I mean, there, that's just, it's just fun. I think there's a fun component of running a franchise that in the startup business, um, you don't have that business saying that, you know, the pioneers in a segment get slaughtered and the settlers prospers. Franchise, these are the settlers. <laughs> they come into an established space not having to bootstrap it or figure out all the hard stuff out and can just run at a, a rapid clip. It's, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Mm. It, re it really is. And, and Gen Z's, my gosh, they're the future of franchising, right? Right. And, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a segment of franchise owners that are really underserved and, and overlooked. Yeah. In the last three years, they've made up about 30% of the people I recruit, um, but they're 60% of my top performers. Like they... They outperform a middle-aged guy like myself, like three to one. Like, and, you know, it's because this is sounds silly, but you, you don't remember what you did when you're my age. You don't remember what you did in your twenties. Like I, like it's a hazy, like 10 years of bad mistakes and bad relationships and bad ideas and bad hair and bad clothes and bad everything. Like it just doesn't matter. You can screw up massively in your twenties and there's no real serious long-term consequences of that. So if mm. you don't, they're not afraid to fail. Not that failure is like an awesome thing to endure, but this generation really has a different idea. Failure, if you're not failing, you're not trying and failure, you should learn from every failure. And that's really just the, that's how you swing the bat. It's the Babe Ruth rule. You know, Babe Ruth got the most um, home runs, but he also had the record the same year for the most strikeouts. That's not the part we don't talk about the strikeouts. <laughs> so I think franchising is if you're unafraid to fail, franchise you probably won't fail with franchising because it's so much of a higher success rate overall. But I think they look at franchising as this social community part of business, and it's just a fast track to entrepreneurship for a lot of people. And that's that's new in franchising. That's not the way people have ever thought of franchising. They think of it as some kind of weird multi-level marketing kind of spinoff or some kind of hidden society where there's huge agreements <laughs> and everybody kind of is litigate, you know, like they don't understand what it is. So you get into it and you go, oh, this is actually pretty cool. I love what you just said, you know, relating to Gen Z franchising is, is a uh, social franchising is a sh social networking of, of business. Yeah. And uh, I've never thought of it that way. That's a really neat way to think about it. That's and the, clearly. Yeah. That's the it, reason that, businesses fail is uh, you've run a business it's lonely <laughs> you were telling when we first met at the emerging franchise you were telling me about running starting your business i think in your mom's basement or so you, i thought you were joking but you were really serious <laughs> you like literally started it in your mom's basement which is an awesome story in itself but the um you know like it's lonely and you have to have like you know like balls of steel to do that like it's not like it's not an easy thing to to go against all the feedback the negative feedback you get as a founder or an entrepreneur to, and to go into franchising and not have any experience in franchising and boy, that's a tough learning curve. It's not a quick thing. It's why it, it isn't that um, the reason franchise systems kind of go out of business is has more to do with the founders can't get through the learning curve. Like they just mm -hmm. can't, they can't even understand the stuff we're talking about in this conversation. And so that's one of the things that I'm real committed to professionally is trying to help people avoid that dip because it is possible mm -hmm. for people to learn the stuff we're talking about. Yeah, as a founder, you have to let go and go on mute. Everybody in the organization's favorite moment is when you go on mute. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I hear that a lot. I haven't listened to it as much as I should, but I, but I hear it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I, Gen X also, or Gen Z, are, um, they have this um, idea that well, I, I don't think they want to work in a traditional job. I think the idea of working 40 hours in an office is, 
it's they equate that to having a phone call with somebody like i don't know i have kids that are gen z so i have six kids and four of them are gen z's um they don't talk on their phone like a phone is it for talking on like they'll talk to their parents if they have to <laughs> but it's they use the phone to text and communicate visually and with videos and in snapchats and all that kind of stuff um, but like, if you ask them to talk on the phone, that's like a painful experience. They don't understand. It's like writing an email. Like, why do I have to write an email? Why can't I just instant, why can't I just text you? You know, their form of communication is really different. And I think they don't want to work in an office for the same reasons. The idea that you'd give up 40 hours your entire week to sit in somebody else's office and do what they want you to do just seems like not worth the pay on the flip side. Um, whereas running a business or multiple businesses, which is what I see a lot of them do, and having several side hustles seems like the preferred path. They can get to 100K of income much quicker that way than working their way up through the ranks and kind of paying their dues because they really don't see the reason to do that anymore. Like anybody who's got any skills can go out and make 70 or $80,000 in today's market. It's just too many options for people. And so I think that's where franchising really shines is, you know, we have this ability to attract people who want I call them the jobs are for losers generation. <laughs> like they just, they just don't think jobs are like, you know, every other generation was taught that you have to have a job. You have to have a job. You have to go to college. You have to do this. You have to do that. They're like, wait, that's just a bunch of crap. Like they don't think that that's really like, I would much rather go work with Nick and learn how to run a painting crew and learn how to market and manage people and learn how to build a, like a leveled up business. That would be much better. Uh, like well, who wouldn't want to do that? Hmm. You know, Thomas, uh, you know, chatting with you, you know, it's uh, it's making it a lot clearer why founders and uh, franchise organizations struggle to get through, you know, the learning curve of being a franchise system. And, you know, it's just hitting me that, you know, we talk so much about being in business for ourselves, but not by ourselves. And that's so many times put in the in the context of a franchise owner. It's very rarely put in the context of a franchisor or founder or leadership group of a franchise system. Um, but yeah. that's really what we're talking through is growing that muscle. You know, I joked and said, hey, you know, when the founder goes, or the leadership team goes on mute, you know, it's, it eliminates that top down and it, it um, you know, is the, the foot forward of the franchisor creating that community of, hey, we're in business for ourselves, but not by ourselves, right? That social network. Um, all too many times, the leadership group behind a franchise system doesn't participate and, or, or minimizes the ability to participate in being in business with other business owners. Um, and that clearly creates a lot of frustration and and frankly, when initiatives are developed without the franchise owners in mind, you know, to, to your example with the coffee franchise, you know, you had done all this work, boots on the ground, and their best beta was what you had done with the menu, but they independently built a menu that probably was not betaed over a period of time and data captured and, and uh, you know, ran amongst a few locations before standardizing across the system rather you know they worked it out amongst themselves and then came to you and other owners really the system and and presented this new way of doing business and the whole time your hands are up like look i've been working on the same thing directly in my market with the clients and there's real data here that's leading to uh growth uh but yet you know, there's not an ear or really an infrastructure to allow for that collaboration, uh, that feedback loop. You know, so much of McDonald's menu was created by franchise owners, right? And and uh, the the breakfast sandwich was was created by a McDonald's franchise owner. And you look at breakfast in fast food in general. I mean, McDonald's was a huge influence of that. And behind that was a franchise owner. It's really the secret sauce of a franchise organization, but it's creating the infrastructure uh, to, to do just that, innovate and, and a beta and isolate um, innovation and, and, to, and to get that properly documented and, and beta tested out 
and, and let the numbers and the data speak for itself and, and to have the owners aware of that process that's really being led by the franchise owners, but facilitated by the home office. So you have that, that collaboration there where you have the home office teeing up and organizing and, and really the, the hands and feet behind the work, but it's out in the field. The franchise owners are that collective genius, uh, but they don't have the extra time beyond running their business to create the infrastructure and beta and facilitate. That's where the home office brings a tremendous amount of value. Um, and it, it takes some time for a franchise system to develop all that and get in stride culturally, system-wise, department-wise, people-wise, uh, there's a lot to it. And uh, it, it doesn't happen overnight. So, yeah. tough, that's, that's, if there was one takeaway from this conversation for new franchisors, um, what you just articulated is perfect. You have to, as a franchisor, lead with initiatives and make a clear, transparent business case for everything you want to do. And you have to get buy-in from franchisees before you throw the lever. And like that just means you you really have to actually have a beta, not just uh, the marketing guy's idea or the operation guy's idea, not just an idea in a corporate store that is not run by a franchisee. You have to actually test things in a franchise environment somewhere. And I find when, you know, like when I, I'll always get at least three volunteers and say, like, we're going to experiment, say like a menu and we're going to try three versions of the menu and we're going to get people to tell us what does and doesn't work and we'll subsidize the cost and da, 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 da. and then we're going to look at the data after 120 days and see which one's the winner and we're going to talk about it and that's what we're going to use to define the next version of our engineered menu like everybody likes that no franchise owner is going to get their feelings hurt or feel alienated or pissed off about that because you're you're being inclusive and you're being transparent and nobody's really got an agenda other than that we're here to help you reach that goal that you want of higher revenue, higher margin, more popular menu, whatever it is. And that can be any system in any franchise system. But that set of steps, people so rarely follow um, and it's so easy to follow. <laughs> Just It's not hard to ask. They want a seat at the table. They, they're in the business all day, every day. Like They for sure want to help you pilot things and experiment with stuff. And we'll try. Th I've never had a franchisee turn me down. But what I get on the back end of that is I get a brand champion for the initiative <laughs> that says, I did this. It kicked ass. Like, oh my gosh, everybody should be doing this. Here's my data. Here's what I did. Here's the step-by-step. -step. Boom. And then like, I don't even have to like push it. It just happens organically because it's like a, it's like a viral Facebook post. <laughs> it's, it's the social media part of business. Like it's like, what a great lesson to teach if we could teach people that as a franchisor. I think that that one misunderstanding of that the corporate people and its um, lead initiatives is what does tons of relationship damage. I, I see it at franchise conferences as a supplier. I've been to hundreds of franchise conferences. And my, my advice for people is that if you're going to have a two day or two and a half day conference, limit the corporate staff to three hours or less of presentations, like maybe the first morning have a state of the union and the marketing stuff. Here's what we're going to do and have a guest speaker and then shut the hell up <laughs> and let like go on mute. And then go on mute. It has ease on the stage and let them run the show and just facilitate dialogue. And you know, the feedback you'll get is like, oh my gosh, like we had to listen for a couple hours of you guys, but that presentation on how to sell painting was really amazing. I love what John Doe did about his, in his market and, you know, everybody gets on the edge of their seat. You've seen that in your system too. People are like really get excited about sharing what their wins are. And so you got to create a platform for that. And the so people first, you know, corporate second kind of idea. It's the opposite of American business. Well said. And, and uh, you know, we're clearly talking about what creates high-performing franchise owners, what creates high-performing franchisors and franchise systems in general. You know, this is all communication and uh, relationships in businesses about people. And, and uh, this is the franchise business model, right? And the relationships and cadence that create a successful relationship uh, that leads to a performance culture. Uh, as Thomas uh, mentioned earlier, you know, another part of this, which leads to success and is important to uh, long-term sustainability is marketing. And so I wanted to hear from you, Thomas, because this is something that you do so well with your brand uh, uh, journalist background. 
you know, what would you share to uh, give the audience some context around the marketing support that you do for your franchise owners? Yeah, I think that's such an important point and it, it gets really left in by the wayside. I believe that if you're going to charge somebody royalties, um, you need to justify the royalties you charge in terms of positive marketing momentum you've delivered for the franchisee. I, I found early on in my career, 20 years ago as a franchise award, that if I could go to franchise X and say, look, you know, you spent your royalties are $2,000 this month, but look through the marketing systems and the ad fund and what you did and what we've done for you with the local website, you got 77 leads this month, which equated to $30,000 worth of sales in that particular business. And isn't that awesome? <laughs> and when you present data that way, nobody minds paying royalties because it's a clear ROI on it. But if you don't take the time to lay out the pieces in the case of all human nature, when in the absence of information, we make up the worst case scenario. I'm just paying because every franchise system will get to a point where the franchisees are really solid and they don't, um, it's all about them. You know, they're doing it by themselves and they're not at all doing it by themselves. Like they have no clue what they're doing, but in their mind, they're not supported. So when you're constantly pushing um, marketing, so, and I think marketing and operations today have really melded together. Like I think in a service brand, we really are marketing businesses. Like marketing is very essential. It always perplexes me when I see franchise service brands and franchising who have no internal marketing staff and no systems and no structure. And they just dump a lot of stuff on outside vendors or tell people to go figure it out themselves. Like that's that's not like you want a franchise to have some standardization and have better marketing is the thing that perplexes business owners. It's the reason most independent businesses fail is they can't get a handle on it. So why would you think somebody in a franchise system? I mean, I talk to people all the time. I'm amazed at the poor quality of internal marketing systems, but you have to have average marketing systems that will get an average franchise owner to average unit performance. Like that's the minimum, that's the price for admission as a franchisor. If you can't say that with confidence, you, you're really, you don't have a viable model. You're going to have churn and then you're going to stop growing. What do you think about that? Well, yeah, 100%, right? Uh, leads are the oxygen behind a business. Right. And uh, no matter what your conversion rate is, whether it's 1% or 90% or probably more realistically, 30 to 60%, uh, whatever your closing rate is, you're going to close jobs at whatever your conversion is. And as a result, you need, you need more leads because it's going to create more revenue, which is yeah. going to create more bottom line. For sure. Yeah, we could have a whole nother podcast on marketing tactics and strategies. That would take a whole hour, but we're going to run out of time here in just a few minutes. But uh, it's it's been a really good conversation. Like I hope people listen to this conversation because this is valuable information for a new franchisor for sure. Hmm. If you were to give uh, a, a single tip on on marketing, uh, what what would that be, Thomas? Well, I would say go where people are. Like that's the thing. I think people we um, in our industry are not as nimble as we should be. And, and think if I think about what I'm doing on marketing with my systems, we're doing lots of explanatory short form video advertising where we take, like I, I have people go out and document a job every week, at least one job. I prefer you do it every day, but at least once a week, go out and document a dryer vent job with your camera, have your tech do it. And just like, here we are in front of the house, Miss Jane called and her dryer stopped up and says, it's not working. And look behind the dryer. Here's what it looks like. We show the camera inside the line. We show it, you know, full of lint. Here's what we took out. You know, now it's running great and clean. And we just do a whole, like a little 60 second narrative of a, a typical visit. And we do voiceover on it and we put that on our channel. So it gets viral kind of organic traction as it is, but you can turn that into an ad <laughs> and the ad is like real legs with it today. And so I find that that's like, if I was doing painting, I would be doing that about, you know, like tips to look at a new good painter in Franklin, Tennessee, like where I am, like what's, what should you be looking for? And like, here's what we did. Look out for this quality of paint. It was in a 60 second video. You can show a lot of pointers and people like love to watch the journey of a job from start to finish. But, you know, if I look in the closet business, we do that with our up closets. We do before and afters and explain the problem and show what the closet looks like and then show it demo then put us put it back together. And then the, the polished product that looks really beautiful. And we do, but when we get thousands of views on those and turn them into ads and, um, you know, my competitors in that space, um, they're still doing Valpac and <laughs> paid search and 
you know, home shows. And like, I don't ever come across those guys in the market. There's 15 other closet companies in Nashville. My wife runs the local one. Like we're, we're like in a sea of people that we're not, that are just talking to us. It's really awesome. But that's just because you have to stay where people are and they're looking on social media and, you know, your phone listens to you because you probably have microphone enabled for a bunch of apps and it knows what you're talking about. And, know, you know, so I, my ads that you create are now suddenly like you can be really intentional in who you're targeting. It's a, we had good kind of creepy is what I like to say. It's beneficial for the business. And it's helpful to the person that's looking for it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Good kind of creepy, <laughs> uh, but transformations and how to's on social media. Uh, the key there, the takeaway is you have to capture and document, right? So get into that rhythm of, you know, to Thomas's point, ideally do it daily, but at least do it weekly, you know, create a cadence for yourself where you're using a very simple device, your, your cell phone to capture transformations and how to's, um, and, uh, getting in front of where people are, which is on their phone, on social media. Yeah. And they have these little, um, they have these little tiny, like, you know, these microphones that go on your cell phone that you can carry with you all the time. Um, you know, we do it for franchise recruitment too. Like I do short form videos for franchise recruitment and they're very effective, you know, and that's, I think the, the streams of relative information where people can get to understand that what you actually do is like testimonials on steroids. You know, it's like if I see 10, 10 houses in and around my community from a vendor who's clearly knows what they're doing and has beautiful vans and the people are professional and the customers are happy and the houses look correctly. And I can go drive by the house and see it myself. Like I'll get that business because nobody else is doing that. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the future. That's a, a dramatic shift in how we kind of develop marketing systems. You know, it's good for us. Uh, you know, we're a little more nimble and thankfully my competitors aren't as nimble. <laughs> So we, we're on a mastermind group um, with JT's on our mastermind group. And he's one of my competitors in this space. So I always keep my mouth shut on that call when it comes to that. <laughs> Don't tell Yeah, me. keep keep that one low, low there. <laughs> Somebody will learn how to do that at some point. And then it'll be on to something else. I think you just have to go where people are and you have to look for the underutilized marketing strategies. And that's something the franchisor should be doing all the time. That's a huge value add for, I think you should be looking ahead always and be aware of what the changes are. You can affect change on a global scale much faster than a traditional startup company can. Yeah. Attention is constantly shifting wherever that medium is. And, and, and so as a franchisor trying to evaluate, Hey, where's our best ROI for yeah. the most amount of attention. And today that is social media and video short form video. But you have to get into the cadence of creating that organic content. Um, it's simple, right? You can get on a phone and do it. Uh, Thomas, this has been an incredible conversation. We'll have to do this again. To your point, we could we could spend an entire episode on social media alone. And you've done such a great job of building your brand and, and sharing so much information for free online. Uh, if people would like to reach out to you and, and learn more, uh, how can they do that? Sure. Um, homerunfranchises.com is our website. Um, you can see me on LinkedIn under Thomas Scott, um, T. Scott at homerunfranchises.com. And I'm on Instagram and TikTok. You can find me on all those places. Um, I post videos every day with this kind of content. It's a personal branding. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I encourage people to do more of that. Uh, but thanks for having me. It's been an awesome conversation. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I most certainly have leveled up. I hope you as, as well. Uh, and until next time, take care. All right. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Level Up with Nick Lopez show. Remember, it's never too late to get started on your entrepreneurial journey. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share if you enjoyed today's segment. Catch us again next week and visit LimePainting.com for more of the Level Up with Nick Lopez show.